Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to every one of you. My name is Joy Carter, I'm the Vice Chancellor, and it's my pleasure on behalf of the entire university community to welcome you here tonight to this very special event. So from me, a few words about the university and then a few words about Anna. So first of all, let me say about the university, we are passionate about social justice, about compassion, and care for all life and our planet. We like to call it values in action. And one fantastic example of values in action is our Centre for Religions, Reconciliation and Peace. The centre works all over the world. It shares excellence in knowledge, understanding, skills, relationships, and best practice in reconciliation and peace building. It aims to create a free, to help to create a free, just, and peaceful world. And why I'm telling you about this is one of the key people behind this centre is tonight's speaker. So now let me tell you about Professor Anna King. Anna grew up close to the sea in Sussex. She had a very loving upbringing at home and was later sent to Catholic boarding school. Following that, she attended a girls' grammar school and she spent every non-school hour mucking out stables and eventually was elevated to riding Clonmac, an Arab Connemara cross. And a very special animal, wasn't it? Wasn't it? So as a teenager, she became a famous actress. She acted in every school production going. She played assorted characters, and I'll tell you some of them. These included Richard II, <laughs> Elizabeth I, no less, Shylock and St Cuthbert. And she was also entered in Greek and Latin poetry competitions. And she tells me she remembers that authentic pronunciation in these competitions was a very divisive issue. So Anna completed her first degree in history. And in her third year, something very special happened. She picked up, by chance, a book with the title Witchcraft and Magic Among the Azand by E.E. E. Evans Pritchard. And this book was to change her entire life. Inspired by it, she went off to Oxford University to follow the graduate course in social anthropology. And there you do an MPhil, a B lit, a D -phil. And she specialised in Indian religions and cultures. Not satisfied with that, she studied Hindi at Cambridge and spent two years living on the banks of the Ganges with priests and sadhus. Let me say that again. Anna spent two years living on the banks of the Ganges with people alongside her. What an extraordinary lady to do something like that. Of course, she was learning, she was teaching, she was soaking up the culture. And she hasn't stopped because she's always abroad and doing exciting and adventurous things even now. Uh, she's undertaken fieldwork in Pakistan, in Thailand, in Nepal, in Myanmar, all sorts of amazing places. Now, going back a bit, she um, had a daughter, a lovely daughter, Sophia. Sophia here this evening? Yes, somewhere. Sophia, welcome. You are warmly welcome. So after the birth of Sophia, she completed a PGCE in religious studies at Cambridge and a part-time three-year course in psychotherapy and counselling. Anna taught at the Open University and Sixth Form Colleges and then became director of the Multicultural Anti-Racist Research Project at the University of Cambridge and lecturer in religious studies in the Department of Education. That must have been an exciting time, Anna. But in 1992, something exciting for us happened because we managed to entice Anna to Winchester and that was lucky for us. She joined the Department of Theology, Religious Studies and Philosophy and it was an exciting time there because the study of religions 
was perhaps at its most controversial, innovative and exciting. And there were highlights for the students, including visits to Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So more recently, Anna has joined the Winchester Centre for Religions, Reconciliation and Peace that I described earlier, that was 2011. And in her own words, she's been idyllically happy there ever since, which is wonderful, because we're delighted you're there too. She's a founder editor of Religions of South Asia. She's edited and co-written several books, written many articles, and been consultant on two ethnographic films, no less. She is a remarkable, talented lady. And Anna is one of the university's star researchers. And we love her very much. <laughs> Together with Dr. Mark Owen, who's the director of the centre that I just described, they help the Theology and Religious Studies Unit gain a four-star in the recent Research Excellence Framework. Now, for those who don't follow things like the REF, let me explain to you what this means, because it's really significant. It means that their research has been judged by peers all over the country as world-leading in terms of originality, significance, and rigour. Isn't that fantastic? Anna, dearest, you're a very special part of our university community and we are endlessly thankful to you for your years of service to academic and research excellence and the important work you're now doing in the centre. And you're just a lovely colleague too. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in giving Professor Anna King a very warm welcome. Actually, thank you very much for coming. Um, I can't tell you how moved I am. It's been absolute joy to me to see so many people that have come. I, I really am incredibly grateful and touched. And also, can I say that if you don't hear me, please would you tell me immediately? Um, I'm going to talk for about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, and then show a PowerPoint. So there is some respite that you are going to, to get. So, and I'm afraid I'm going to read this because otherwise I will just diverge and you'll be here all night. <laughs> the greatest threats to humanity are war and genocide, weapons of mass destruction, ethnic, ethnic and religious conflict, global inequality and catastrophic climate change. Amnesty International in its 2016-17 report notes that it's been the year of us against them. We've witnessed the worsening plight of refugees and displaced persons all around the world. Syria as a global battleground, thousands losing their lives trying to reach Europe, the onslaught against civilians in Aleppo, Yemen and Darfur, Turkey's escalation of violence against dissent and the rise of racism linked to the politicization of migration across Europe. Over the last decades, there's been the rise of Hindu nationalism in India, Buddhist nationalism in Thailand, Sri Lanka and Myanmar, Christian flight from the Middle East and religiously inspired conflicts, not only in Syria, but in Afghanistan, Nigeria, Turkey, Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, and Israel-Palestine. The terrorist attacks in Parliament Square and Russia are also fresh in our minds. Such events are contributing to a dramatic re-examination of the role of religion in conflict and peacebuilding. Many conflicts, past and present, are perceived and problematized as religious. However, academic research tends to take it for granted that religious conflicts as such do not exist and that religion is merely one of several factors which cause, exacerbate or pacify conflicts. Debate therefore focuses on the question of whether religion is merely exploited in political and social conflicts or whether it contains elements which inherently aggravate conflict and promote violence. 
The resurgence of religion, particularly Islam, and its presence in the world stage would have astonished many thinkers of the 20th century. Their belief that religion would eventually die out has proved deeply influential, not only on later sociological theory, but subsequent generations of scholars. Yet religion has become more prominent, both as a source of peace and tolerance, and as a source of violence and terror. Religious militancy, now one of the most feared forces in 20th century global politics, plays a part not only in terrorist attacks, but in responses to them. Following the attacks of September the 11th, 2001, the American government's response of a war on terror and good versus evil typologies became itself a source of controversy, as critics claimed that it's been used to justify military action, human rights abuses, and other violations of international law. Meanwhile, the emergence and proliferation of Islamist movements such as Al-Qaeda and Daesh has meant that religion has become in inextricably linked to violence, whether in the form of armed conflict, genocide, or terrorism. Perhaps this shouldn't surprise us. All major religions have complex histories and doctrines that are often highly ambiguous and internally inconsistent. Over the centuries, they've been interpreted and reinterpreted to serve the interests of particular groups for both progressive and reactionary political goals. Religious authority and texts are often quoted to justify and sanctify violence. Sri Lankan Buddhist monks supported the violent campaign against the Tamil Tigers, a Marxist-Leninist Hindu group, in the belief that war could be justified by Buddhist scripture and tradition. Daesh, or ISIS, follows an extremist interpretation of Wahhabi Islam, declaring itself a worldwide caliphate and emphasizing eschatology and apocalyptism. I knew I wouldn't learn to say that. In an interview with me, a Christian Baptist minister, a prominent member of Kachin's KIO, justified armed conflict because Jesus speaks for justice as well as peace. Examples of religiously inspired political movements come from all the major religions. Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, South Sudan, the Mabita Buddhist nationalist movement in Myanmar, Christian right-wing groups in the US, such as the Army of God, and some would argue groups of Israeli Jewish settlers on the West Bank. However, religions are internally plural and militants are generally censured, disowned, and fiercely denounced by their larger community. Shifting dynamics of conflict, for example, in Syria, can rarely be explained simply in terms of fundamentalist religious ideologies. And in the Northern Ireland conflict, euphemistically known as the Troubles, religion, whether Protestant or Catholic, helped to define intra-community solidarity but many of the political actors did not define themselves as religiously motivated or explain their goals in religious terms. I'm now going to talk about religious peace. If, as the Amnesty Report states, the 20th cent 21st century is an age of conflict, it's also an age of peace building, dialogue, civil society conciliation groups, truth commissions, internal tribunals, UN peace operations, and human rights advocacy. Such developments mean, in principle, a widespread adoption of the language and policies of reconciliation, understanding and cooperation, instead of the politics of self-interest, power and prestige. And the preoccupation with the relationship between religion and violence has led to the field of religious peacebuilding, which claims that religious traditions possess creative peacebuilding potential, ideals, theology, ethics, spirituality, institutional capacity, and the ability to mobilize thousands, if not millions, of people. They have ethical and practical resources, values of love, compassion, forgiveness, mercy, nonviolence, the sanctity of all life, stories, healing rituals, philosophy, music, art, dance, prayer, meditation, and mental and physical discipline. Peace activists, it asserts that profound, profound religious and ethical convictions 
can lead to conflict, but also help build world order, that spiritual vocations translate into healing fractured societies and peace-promoting values into ethics of negotiation, mediation, forgiveness and reconciliation. And Lisa Church argues persuasively for the importance of ritual in overcoming trauma and transforming conflict. It offers a way for people to learn through their bodies, emotions and senses, and to communicate symbolically a commitment to nonviolence, to heal and to restore relationships. Consider, for example, the impact of the candlelit vigils at the time of ISIS attacks in London, Paris, Brussels and Berlin. Many of the world's charismatic leaders have been inspired by faith, and some, like many secularists, believe that the search for peace, human rights, and democracy is in itself a spiritual quest. And the idea that one is acting for God, or truth, or Dharma, can carry an enormous sense of power. The Dalai Lama, like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, and Mahatma Gandhi, has been tirelessly energetic in advocating radical nonviolence and ecumenical and interfaith dialogue. He teaches that Buddhism is a religion of peace and that all the world's major religions promote universal values of love, compassion, patience, tolerance, and forgiveness. Like many spiritual leaders, he believes that the spiritual transformation of the self will in the end transform society. But others have gone in the opposite direction, understanding that demands of social justice should transform religion rather than vice versa. And they've played a vital role in movements of the poor and oppressed. Dr. Ambedkar, the great Dalit leader who struggled all his life against the inherited violence of the caste system, believes strongly that it is a transformation of social structures that leads to the freedom of the person. In Nicaragua in the 1980s, many Catholic priests and people inspired by liberation theology supported the Sandinista government and their pro-poor agenda. Archbishop Romero in El Salvador and Bishop Gerardi in Guatemala were assassinated for their part in disclosing past human rights abuses. Rabbis for Human Rights is an inclusive rabbinical organization in Israel in which rabbis work together in the occupied territories, confronting the Israeli army in instances of abuse, protecting Palestinian homes and olive graves, and giving out food and clothing. There are thousands of faith-based NGOs working for social justice and peace in conflict and post-conflict areas of the world. Religious groups have played a major role in many truth recovery processes in Northern Ireland, Latin America, Bosnia, and South Africa. And world faiths can often call upon their international networks to support oppressed people. And as the world becomes globally networked and digitally connected, those communities are increasingly virtual. Our partner, Religions for Peace International, asserts that religious communities bring uniquely important social, spiritual, and moral assets to the quest for peace. St. Etherberger's, another partner, sets out to be a maker of peacemakers and to inspire and equip individuals and communities to contribute in their own particular context to advocating a global culture of peace. I'm now going to talk about religion and violence. However, for some professionals, academic, and peace activists, religion is itself the problem from which they're trying to help people escape. Many of the theories advanced to explain religious violence or genocide suggest that religions, particularly Abrahamic religions, are intrinsically violent because they create boundaries of others who then become a target for dehumanization, scapegoating, and demonization. Tyke notes that while political critics tend to treat religions as an aside or an obfuscation of the real problems, there are others who see underlying acts of violence, convictions, values, and conceptual frameworks. René Girard argues that violence is at the heart of traditional religion. Intergroup rivalries are kept from threatening the coherence of the group 
by focusing aggression on a sacral vision, sacrificial victim. And Mark Jürgensmeyer, in Terror in the Mind of God, challenges us to appreciate the ideological and mythical importance of terrorist acts for perpetrators. He argues that what unites them is a belief in a cosmic war between good and evil. Religion provides the metaphors of cosmic war, the fight between good and bad, truth and evil, which are accompanied by strong claims of moral justification and an enduring absolutism that transforms worldly struggles into sacred battles. He says, politics have become religionized, worldly struggles have been lifted into the high proscenium of sacred battle. And Oliver Tiernan in Violence in God's Name also argues passionately that religion should not be left, taken off the hook. It should not always be dismissed as a surrogate for grievance, protest, greed, or political ambition, commenting that until each faith group is prepared to promote that actively a respect for the gift of life above all other beliefs, dogmas, and interests, religions will always have the potential to be an exclusive, divisive, and destructive force in the world. And Hans Kung, the Catholic theologian, exhorts us to embrace a global ethic for countering religious violence. The American Catholic theologian, William Kavanagh, argues powerfully that the great myth of religious violence legitimates neo-colonial violence against non-Western others, and itself serves to justify violence, it dismisses the myth completely. He points out that the myth helps Americans, and us too, to think of ourselves as the most peace-loving nations on earth, at the same time that their military budget exceeds those of all other nations combined. And he says, those people over there are crazy religious fanatics. Their violence is irrational, absolutist, and violence divisive. We live in a dem democratic, secular state. Our violence is rational, modest, intuitive, unitive. They have not learned the lesson we learned. Religion should be kept out of the public sphere. So we need to help them by bombing them into the higher rationality. This way of thinking is one of the subtexts of the Iraq war and of much public discourse on terrorism. Structural violence. Peace builders up to now have tended to focus on deadly violence. However, the conditions for a just and sustainable peace require equal attention to religious-based forms of violence and injustice and their social, spiritual, emotional, and psychological effects. For example, Scholarly research shows unequivocally that the inclusion of women in nonviolent peace processes leads to more sustainable peace. Yet in many religious traditions, power and authority remains with men. Until recently, women's experiences of religious peace building were seldom highlighted. In 2000, the United Nations Security Council adopted Resolution 1325, the very first time the international community formally recognized either the impact of conflict on women or the need to involve them as active agents in peace building. Mia Bloom and others refused to see women as merely victims, emphasizing the roles women have played in both secular and religious violent movements, including participation as suicide bombers, shaping cults of martyrdom, cajoling men into fighting, and nurturing religiously biased attitudes or exclusive forms of nationalism. It is true that the lines between militant sympathizer and forced accomplice can become blurred. However, our fieldwork field data suggests that there is often a very strong relationship between political violence and gendered insecurity. Women are often targeted by perpetrators of violence displaced to unknown destinations and subjected to rape and sexual violence. So what are the defining characteristics of religious peace building? Peace building, whether religious or secular, has come to signify all the activities that aim to build sustainable, just and peaceful relationships in the wake of war or other systemic human rights violations. In a more inclusive sense, it means everything we do to create human flourishing and well-being. We are, in that sense, all peacemakers. Underpinning the discipline, theoretically, of a notion of positive peace, 
not just the silencing of bombs and guns. And Scott Appleby's concept of the ambivalence of the sacred, the idea that the experience of the sacred can generate ambivalent responses. That the same religious community may produce both terrorists and peacemakers. And John Lederach defines peace building as both a learned skill and a creative art, an exercise of the moral imagination. He also develops the idea of the elicitive peacemaker as facilitator and catalyst rather than expert. Theoretical debate contrasts the hard liberal or neo peace and what Gopin calls the elicitive religious cultural peace. The liberal secular peace is characterized as the development of liberal or civic nationalism, constitutional democracy, and neoliberal economic policies. It's driven from above by development agencies, government funding, and the foreign policies of Western governments, retributive justice, and human rights. The elicitive religious cultural peace, on the other hand, includes the more theological concepts of just peace, forgiveness, reconciliation, and restorative justice. In Northern Ireland, for example, the adoption of restorative justice techniques and practices help transform destructive practices of punishment into more constructive, non-violent mechanisms of dispute resolution. <coughs> Case studies. I'm now about to go into the PowerPoint. I turn to discuss two case studies in both cases, the center responded to an invitation from Religions for Peace International. Mark, Dr. Mark Owen and I completed a three-year peace building project in Nepal 2011 to 13, 14, and the major part of a three-year project in Myanmar, which involves conflict assessments in three major areas, Kachin, Mithila, and Rakhine. In 10 days time, we're flying out to Yangon and then Rakhine, if the political situation allows. Both countries are undergoing massive political change. Nepal is transforming from a highly centralized Hindu monarchy and unitary state to a secular democracy of devolved federal provinces and is still dealing with the legacy of civil conflict. Myanmar is transforming from an authoritarian military regime to a democratic republic and having to address ethnic and religious conflicts, human rights abuses, mass atrocities, and other forms of severe trauma. I hope I'm going to be able to work this well. So, um, um, this is, I'm sorry, this is a map, <laughs> um, sorry, which uh, shows Nepal. Um, I really wanted you to try and see their neighbours, um, India and China, which are rivals for influence. Um, just to quickly go down this, the civil war lasted for about 10 years. Um, much displacement of the population, IDPs, 17,000 killed. In, the Maoist insurgency, Marxist, Leninist class base, but Brahmin dominated. And I must tell you that I've, sorry, can you hear if I move away um, from the microphone? Um, please do tell me if you can't hear. Um, but you could often see them with a Hindu sort of mark on their head too. So they were a particular kind of Maoist sometimes. Uh, in 2001, there was the massacre of the royal family by the heir apparent. Uh, he killed most of his family, including his mother and father. In 2006, the peace process took a very, very long time. Um, so in 2008, Nepal was declared secular, a secular federal democratic republic. And the comprehensive peace agreement was dissolved in 2012. What's happened since is a fracture. Um, fracturing, really, of society with ethnic and religious groups struggling to, to get rights and to um, gain political attention. Um, I've indulged myself a bit, I think, because 
I do love some of these places. But this is here for a reason. It's Pashupati uh, Temple, in Nepal, which is visited by thousands, millions of Buddhists every year from all um, Hindus every year. Um, but why that is there is because I wanted to explain that the state of Nepal um, was constituted in a Hindu sense and that Hinduism actually shapes quite a lot of the social structure, which is important. So um, the Shah dynasty of the Rana prime ministers ruled Nepal in the name of Hinduism. And the important thing is to remember its extreme diversity, caste, sex, tribes, coexisting and competing. Um, and after the civil war, national and ethnic questions became of crucial importance. Sorry, Anne. Um, I hope you can see all this. I thought it was. I thought it would just take me too long if I did it as a narrative. So Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world, with a, an economy heavily reliant on aid and tourism. I'm sure some of you must have visited it. Um, it was led. The civil war led by Pushpa Kamal Dahal, otherwise known as Prachanda, Nepali for the fierce one, and he has been prime minister. Uh, once or twice since, and he is now Prime Minister. So um, the uh, violent guerrilla has become the politician. Um, the war resulted in massive damage to structures, the economy and the daily lives of citizens. And since the end of the conflict, the country has been involved in a painfully protracted peace process, and it faced the challenge of maintaining cohesion while negotiating a path through structural change. This is Prachanda um, in the days when he was the army leader. Um, I've, got, I've actually got a note here just so that I can inform you. Um, he served as Prime Minister of Nepal from 2008 to 2009, and he was again elected Prime Minister of Nepal in, on August the 3rd, 2016, after his predecessor, K.P. Oli, Oli, resigned. Not necessary for you to know, but still interesting. Um, this is a documentary made of the Maoist army. I wanted to put it in because um, it shows some of the reasons why women were recruited as well as men. So um, she says, it, why was she fighting? At least in part to change the society that led her sister to commit suicide because of an arranged child marriage, where girls from untouchable castes couldn't drink the same water as others, and where the trauma of rapes by government forces in villages was fresh. There were other perspectives in the war. People were forced to join the Maoists and children were conscripted. 40% of the Maoist army were women. Situ, um, Silu, this is what I really wanted to stress. She was eventually elected to the National Assembly and that the Maoist parliament representatives were one third female. I have to say that obviously Nepal isn't like that um, as a whole, but I did I have had quite sort of tragic meetings with Dalits, and perhaps I could tell you about one of them going off script, um, which was um, I met a, a band of musicians with very, who are very, very low caste, and one of the uh, young men, um, they were trying to get funds, and um, he, I got talking to him, and he had come from the, the Burning Ghat, and he said that, um, his brother had married a Brahmin girl, much to the hostility of both families. Um, the family had then disowned her, and she had just committed suicide, and he had come back from the burning ground, the cremation guard, um, with, with the ashes, and her parents had not attended. Of course, um, people of all castes go to universities and so on, but there is a residual... Uh, caste aspect to society. So the causes of the civil war and its aftermath, the pledge to abolish feudalism and the Hindu monarchy, inequality, 
poverty, landlessness, unemployment, neglect of rural areas. High caste Bahun and Chetri Bahadi, hill dwellers' dominance. This may not mean much, but it's, um, it's really the top class have political dominance and the ethnic groups, and also, um, perhaps I say this here later on, but Muslims, um, Dalits, Lokas, um, even other um, minority groups are subjugated or were subjugated. So it's issues of ethnicity, caste, and exclusion came to the fore after the Civil War. And in fact, actually before, there were many advocates, um, even with transnational links. Um, so this is one of Nepal's problems. Buddhists, some Buddhists, uh, self-defined Buddhists resented the state's special recognition of and protection of Hinduism. You may know that um, the Buddha was actually born in Nepal, um, in Kapilavastu, and um, all Nepalis are very proud of this, and India sometimes disputes it. The conflict um, has therefore facilitated the democratization of Nepali politics and provided marginalized populations, particularly Dalits, Janjati, those are the ethnic communities, often Buddhist, and women with a voice. As I said, the monarchy was abolished in 2008. Nepal became a secular state in 2007, 2015. The new constitution allowed freedom of religion. However, Hindu nationalists and monarchist right-wing parties gain encouragement from India's politics, and Christians, Dalits, Madeshis, and Muslims still encounter hostility and sporadic violence. There's been a lot of progress, but the legacy of conflict remains. The ethnic groups from which the Maoist insurgency gave most support um, are the most dissatisfied with the pace and degree of change. Um, this is to show you that these are the two kind of rivals for influence. Um, this is the president of China, and this, you probably know, is the prime minister of India, who actually, in that photograph, is, is, is talking about the Buddha, the Buddha as the Prince of Peace, but it cut it off, actually. So these are powerful neighbors and ethnic, um, powerful neighbors and ethnic concerns complicate the drafting of Nepal's constitution. I put this in about Prachanda's recent outreach to China. Prachanda, of course, being a Maoist, um, there is a degree of um, communality. But it's showing that China is now surpassing India in terms of the aid it, it gives. Also, I wanted you to note that the One China policy is very influential in Nepal, and that there are Nepalis who are stateless, who cannot work legally, who are still there, and who are kind of marooned. They can't go anywhere. If we go to Bauda, Baudanath, then we will sort of see beautiful people lighting oil lamps and walking about. But the reality for many Tibetans is very, very different. Right, what were the aims of our Winchester project? Well, they were to work collaboratively with our partners, Religions for Peace, and the Department of Conflict, Peace and Development Studies, Tribhuvan University. We wanted to support them and their organizations work more effectively in alliance with other civil society groups, politicians and policy makers. For example, the Interreligious Council of Nepal, United States Institute for Peace, UNESCO, UNICEF, etc. To explore when, whether, and how faith-based leaders, communities, and organizations influence the work of national peace building, development, and human rights advocacy. To support religions for peace build relationships, both vertically and horizontally, bringing national religious leaders, Maoist government ministers, international NGOs, and academics, together with community leaders, grassroots organizations, women's groups, Janajathis, victims of violence, grassroots activists. This uh, idea of bringing people together vertically, politicians and the poor and people who are their advocates, and also spreading it widely internationally, this is a very common idea in religious peacemaking. So to promote women's leadership, 
coordinate strategies and pool resources and capabilities for cooperative action for peace, to analyze the wider international context, in particular, the roles of China, India, and the US. The impact, um, Joy was kind enough to refer to our four star, and um, this is partly what we got it for. Um, I don't really know whether I need to read it to you, but we were there to support, record, and evaluate um, to help Religions for Peace create a platform from which religious leaders could address politicians, the medias, and their own communities um, on, for example, strikes, bands. These are um, things which close down Kathmandu and all over Nepal. In fact, when we held our conference, the first day was cancelled because of a bund, and I was very worried, but everyone just took it for granted and turned up the next day. Um, so, violence against women, poverty, illiteracy, attacks on Christian churches and pastors, which are considerable. The plight of Muslim women, they're often the most poor, the most oppressed, and the lack of hope and optimism among Nepali youth. Um, our project came to a sort of crescendo, I'm not sure that's the right word, um, in a conference on peace and development, which was actually opened by the Maoist government minister for peace and reconstruction by lighting an oil lamp. And we also had um, a Buddhist nun singing Buddhist chants. Um, she's famous all around the world, a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, so there was a commitment to campaign against child marriage, discrimination against women, Dalits, and other oppressed groups, commitment to support girls' education. I've put in there provision of bicycles and toilets, and it may look very odd, but actually it's one of the most important and valuable things you can actually do because um, sometimes there are no toilets, and when girls menstruate or when they need to go to the loo, it becomes extremely difficult, and it's also quite a vulnerable time for them. Um, there was also an appeal from religious leaders to members of Christian and other evangelical faiths to refrain from proselytization and conversion. This is a very, very common attitude. Um, Christian organizations do amazingly well, but they are sometimes accused of trying to convert. Um, then we reported to the Nepal government and various uh, academic and religious organizations um, resulting in conferences, peace conferences, publications. This is just to show the kind of situation that we were in when we put on workshops. This is a border community um, which is experiencing um, tensions. And so um, we brought them together with the United States Institute of Peace to talk to each other, to try and um, get them talking um, and eating together. Um, so border towns are sometimes experiencing quite a high level of tension. This is, um, these are really just to sort of show you. Um, these are, this is a group of people demonstrating to return to um, a Hindu rastra, a Hindu state, um, and they want religious freedom without conversion, total ban on stealthy cow slaughter, that is um, actually slanted at Muslims, honour to Hindu kingdom in Nepal and protection of Sanskrit and Vedic culture, and a strong, sorry, this, this is a quote, strong retaliation came up in the congregation against the Christian conversion and the probable Islamic aggression in Nepal, trying to give some sort of some sort of idea of the religious tensions that there can be. This is a very typical, rather middle-class looking meeting of religious leaders against child marriage, which at the time was a very, um, very much to the fore of political discussion. So this is the kind of thing that we did. Um, Nepal, interreligious collaboration in relief efforts. Just to say that there, um, collaboration carries on after we've left, as it, as it would, of course, but to show that the Religions for Peace family and its different levels, international, 
Asia, Nepal, began to work together. And can I praise, please, my colleague, Mark Owen, who was very instrumental in getting supplies out to the earthquake. And we also fundraisers raised here. So Christian churches, Caritas, um, a wonderful reputation in Nepal, helping quake survi survivors. And I'm now rapidly moving on to Myanmar. Um, just if you can see that on either side of Myanmar are Bangladesh, China, and Thailand. And this is where um, refugees will go across the border. So the borders are very um, places of, of violence, um, as you will see. Um, so I'm sure you, you all know this, but Myanmar, the civil war. Um, so our second project, which is ongoing, is in Myanmar. So Myanmar, um, other name Burma, um, has been in a state of constant civil war since independence in 1948. The Bama or the Burman ethnic group, constitute about 60% of the population, 40% of the landmass dominate the country's social, economic, and political realms. Myanmar is one of the most ethnically diverse countries in the world, with key non-Burman ethnic groups demanding equality in three public realms. The protection of ethnic culture, language, and religion the devolution of tangible executive, legislative, and judicial power to the ethnic states within a true federal union and a democratic form of government. It's not always clear whether the ethnic groups are demanding independence or federal autonomy. With their demands unmet, the ethnic groups turn to armed insurgency. And despite many political and military alliances among them, they've been unable to use these allegiances, alliances to best advantage because of cultural differences and diverse agendas. I put that map in, but it's not completely up to date, as you will see, because it shows that Kachin, um, Kachin, which is in the north, is a place of great violence, which it is. Um, and it shows the region round Sagang and Mandalay as moderately but it doesn't really notice the huge what is going on in Rakhine. So I must very much apologize for that. Um, Rakhine is explosive at the moment, and of course that is where we are trying to go next week. Um, the context, um, Myanmar, transition from a military dictatorship to semi-civilian rule and now to civilian elected government. Army retains strong voice in the government. 2015, um, Aung San Suu Kyi won a victory over the ruling military-backed Union Solidarity and Development Party, USDP. Um, I wanted to put the, the, about the Saffron Revolution in because it shows monks and nuns in a good light. They joined economic and political protests and demonstrations against national military government. There's high political support, public support for democracy as leading to economic improvement, but more traditional values in um, the country as a whole. Theravada Buddhism is practiced by 88% of the population, especially by the Bama, if you remember they're the majority ethnic group. And the, the survey, majority of citizens rejected a secular state, 83% supported a consultative role in lawmaking for religious leaders, and 81% supported a direct link between religion and citizenship. So if democracy is to take hold and thrive in Burma, the new government will have to find a way to promote liberal values in the citizenry and to encourage social trust and political participation. So the conflicts in uh, Myanmar, as you probably know, are between the ethnic states, for example, Kachin, Kaya, Kayan, and Shan, and the government. So they have been, uh, there have been occasional ceasefires, but constant warfare, really. 
and violence due to Buddhist nationalism, which I am sure you've been reading about in the papers um, and which has been described as a form of genocide. Sorry, I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, the, this is a picture of people heralding the election of Aung San Suu Kyi, joyous, celebratory, the international community also joyous, expecting great things, faster-paced democracy. Um, I'm now going to talk about three conflicts, and I'm sorry about this. I will go through it as fast as possible. The Kachin independence movement was founded during the British colonial rule in Burma in the 1940s to address questions of ethnic group and minority representation and rights in predominantly Bama country. Um, the British favoured the ethnic groups and they also favoured Indian immigration, which has left a legacy. The historical nar narrative of Panglon is that the British left, having agreed that after some time, if the ethnic groups were not happy to be part of Burma, they could um, gain autonomy. Michina, where we went, is the multi-ethnic and multicultural capital city, home to these ethnic groups, Kachin, Chan, Lisu, also to quite a few Chinese, Indians, and Bama. The KIA, the um, army of the Kachin, has been fighting the militarized government and the Tatmadaw, Myanmar armed forces with some ceasefire intervals for decades. And despite the NLD victory, the military and security forces still are dominant in the government. They still retain seats in parliament. So the Kachin are fighting for political rights, power distribution, equality, and freedom. The Kachin, I may say this in a minute, but the Kachin were evangelized by American Baptist missionaries and there are also quite a few Catholic there. And actually, we met a Church of England pastor who um, we, we had meetings in his church. And he had actually been to Winchester and knew the bishop. So, um, so discrimination is based on cultural, ethnic, and religious differences. So the Kachin are doubly disadvantaged, really, because they're Kachin. They're not Bama. Um, and they're Christian. Um, so they're excluded. The ethnic and religious minorities are excluded from a nation imagined primarily along Buddhist and Bama lines and spoke, they speak of the ongoing repression of ethnic groups. This is all the more disastrous for them because actually Kachin is incredibly rich. Um, it's got resources, gold, teak, rubies, um, and so on. Um, and what is even more damning in their eyes is that the government and its cronies um, gives contracts to Chinese for logging and mining, which destroys the environment. So there's a whole issue about that. Um, recent violence in Kachin has resulted in the deaths of thousands, the displacement of over 100,000 civilians, and reports of conflict-related violations committed by all parties, including widespread use of landmines, tortures, torture, inhumane and degrading treatment, sexual and gender-based violence, gang rape, arbitrary killings and abductions, including forced labor and use, use as human shields, looting and property confiscation. Perhaps I should say that the Kachin do themselves command some territory, and one does hear that they run the same kind of scams that the Chinese do. But that's not what my informants told me. This is um, a Kachin KIA soldier, very typical. Oh, sorry. Um, so what do we do in Kachin? So I won't perhaps bother with all, but interfaith dialogue, individual and group interviews, contact with religious leaders, faith communities, civil society organizations, KIA, KIO personnel. So we, 
what did the interfaith group and women of faith want? What was their goals? Their goals were friendship across religious boundaries, participation in joint activities, festivals, celebrations, peace education in schools and colleges, empowerment of women, serving in IDP, IDP camps. We went to IDP camps and we were very moved to see that actually the local people did rally around, that the Baptist and Catholic churches were very much um, assisting and supporting people, mainly women, young children and the elderly, because the men had gone off to the mines or they'd gone back to the villages or gone back to the army. So then we evaluated, uh, we evaluated what was happening, um, looked at the, the um, programs they had, vertical horizontal networks, national and international center and state contact, use of religious resources. That was what we did. This, I'm afraid, is a very sad photograph. It's what we were met, met with when we went there. Um, this has actually been tidied up, but it was two young Christian Kachin women teachers who were murdered and raped by um, army, army go the government army. And um, modern social media goes like wildfire um, around communities. And the first thing we were showing were pictures of the victims just afterwards. So th this is a much quieter, gentler image. These um, are nuns. Um, as I say, they were evangelized, but they have Kachian identity. So they're, they're trying to campaign for peace. I'm now going on to look at something which is of great trouble in Myanmar today, which is the rise of hostility towards Muslims and the rise of Buddhist nationalism. So this was the next place where we went to. Um, and again, um, so this is Matila, and um, you can see a map of where the buildings were destroyed and severely damaged. The number of people killed is really unascertained. When we went there, there were m mostly Buddhists in prison, but some Muslims. And um, we had with us field staff who came from different faith backgrounds, but we had one Muslim member of the field team. And um, in order to interview and go and see Muslims, we went at night because they were frightened that um, we might be seen. So Matila, we're coming on to look at the, the rise of Buddhist nationalism, an amazing thing in a peaceful religion. So Matila is a strategically important town in the Mandalay region of central Myanmar. Population, majority Bama Buddhists, sizable Muslim population, smaller ethnic and religious groups, including Hindus, Sikhs, and Christians. So in 2013, which is you know, when we were sort of, our project was active, there was communal violence in Matila. And this is, I think, something I want to emphasize, that it can be triggered by a very small event. In this case, um, an elderly Buddhist couple went to have a gold bangle essayed by a Muslim shopkeeper. It was very fragile, and he broke it. He then gave them very little money for it. They went back, and he beat them. And... Um, they then went to hospital, but rumours absolutely circulated that they'd been killed, that all sorts of things. And then um, people from outside Matila, so we're told, um, came in over the next couple of days and burnt mosques, burnt buildings, and killed. So more than 1,500 homes and shops, more than a dozen mosques and madrasas destroyed. There were all sorts of myths about what was going on in the mosques and madrasas. Some people said that there were guns stored there. Some people said that, you know, that Muslims were walking across Buddhist sacred symbols. All sorts of myths and rumours 
hate speech. Um, social media in, in, in Burma is responsible for quite a lot, I feel. So this is a picture of um, the riots in Metila. Analyzing the conflict and aftermath, local people blame the government, army, outsider Buddhists, and so on. So there's a tendency to um, blame outsiders. And we did interview Buddhist Sayadors who had actually protected Muslims from being killed. Um, the, the other thing was we did find Buddhists had actually married um, Muslims. So Buddhist nationalist organizations contribute to anti-Muslim rhetoric and sentiment, stories linking Buddhism with state institutions and territory used to justify violence, hate speech inciting discrimination and violence, weak law and order structure, collusion by the police, tricks by governments. You're always hearing about tricks by government, and tricks and cronies, and government was really hated and the army hated. Um, the four laws of the so-called protection of race and religion package adopted in 2015, this was to stop Buddhist women marrying outside Buddhism. Discriminately provisions for granting of citizenship on the basis of ethnicity or race, many Muslims cannot get. Um, well, we come to that. So since the late 2013, campaigns supported by Marbatar forced dozens of Muslim-owned slaughterhouses, beef processing facilities across the Ayawadi region to shut down thousands of cows seized from their Muslim owners. The conflict in Rakhine and the international conflict also uh, contributed to the tension. Also, um, one heard over and over again about the high Muslim birth rate need to protect Myanmar, Buddhist heritage and identity. There was a local narrative, and it really was the case of peaceful relations. The Muslims there had been there for generations. They were accepted. They were not in the same category as Rakhine Muslims. So um, enormous enthusiasm for what we were doing, particularly the women. They wanted us to go again. They wanted to have um, mediation and dialogue skills, uh, um, something amazing, really. And a strong determination that this would never happen again. The photograph you saw earlier of that joyful celebration of Aung San Suu Kyi, you can see that things are going slightly wrong here. Um, she has been noticeably silent on what has happened in Myanmar with regard to both the ethnicities and with regard to the Rohingya people. Um, and there is a downward sort of understanding, um, hopefully, that um, this is early days, but there is a sense that all is not well. So she is called the lady, and um, her, the Rakhines. Um, in late 2016, the Myanmar military forces and extremist Buddhists started a major crackdown on the Rohingya Muslims in Rakhine state in response to attacks on border police camps. This resulted in human rights violations, killings, gang rape, arson, other atrocities. Violence between the Rohingya and the Buddhist community killed hundreds and forced about 140,000 people to flee their homes. The military attack grew in, uh, drew international reprobation, um, and Aung San Suu Kyi was criticized for her action and silence. But, of course, people say that um, she still has to remain, to some extent, faithful to military policies. Analyzing the conflict, the Myanmar government's refusal to recognize the Muslim Rohingyas as citizens, typically referred to as Bengalis and viewed as illegal immigrants, fear, hostility, lack of empathy towards the Rohingya people throughout Myanmar. Systematic structural and institutional discrimination in policy, law, and practice, as well as long-standing persecution of the Rohingya, they're just seen as illegal immigrants, basically, rather unlike the Muslims of Mithila. There are strict limitations placed on their personal freedoms, association, property ownership, and movement. 
Rakhine State is the poorest state in Myanmar, poverty, marginalization of Rakhine Buddhists who resent the international concern for Muslims. Following the political system's change from a military regime to a civil administration, freedom of speech was eased and religious discourse also became liberalized. This meant that extremist monks began to conduct sermons attacking Islam, and the Buddhist Sangha, thankfully, distanced itself from Mabata. The recent death of the Muslim lawyer Ko Ni, advisor to Aung San Suu Kyi, shot in the head at Yangon Airport, highlights this persecution of Muslims. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar, Yang Hee Lee, stated that a full purge could be the ultimate goal of the institutional persecution, horrific violence being perpetrated against the Rohingya. This picture is very amazing to me because Mark and I actually went to this conference and we became the people that reported on the conference and drew up the declaration at the end. And actually, um, Sitago Sayador offered us money. He offered to pay for our airfares. But since the university had already paid, I refused. And Mark was very, very cross. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was immoral. <laughs> I, I reconsidered afterwards, but we, it was too late. Um, so um, what is amazing about him and the conference was that people from all around the world came to this Buddhist conference speaking all about peace, nonviolence, the dying down of lust, hatred and greed, etc. But um, he is, was the vice chair of Mabata and um, I'm not sure I fully realized quite at the time. Um, so... Um, this is what he said afterwards. Um, and I'm sorry if it's, it may be slightly wrong to show these kind of things, um, but just to show the kind of what it is that Buddhists are on about. So living in constant fear of Islamic extremists. Um, and perhaps I could just leave you to read that. This is the kind of propaganda put out by extreme Buddhists. And, and, and the claim, you see, that he says they claim themselves as, Bang they don't claim themselves as Bengalis, nor claim Mujahideen, but claiming themselves as Rohingyas, they're trying to demand a separate homeland. They also burn their houses by themselves, as if it was done by Burmese Buddhists. We cannot compete with the Islamic world which is the second most powerful and wealthy. Islamic countries occupy the second largest portion in the United Nations. So this is the kind of rhetoric that is disseminated. This is the most radical of all Buddhist preachers. Um, his name's Ashin Bharatu, the nationalist Buddhist monk, leader of the religious organization known as the Mabata. The Sangha led a counter-movement. At first, it, it really didn't, but then it disassociated itself from radical monks and put the Buddha's ethical and philosophical teachings at the center of its message. Viratu served several years in jail for inciting deadly anti-Muslim riots in 2003. In January 2015, he called a UN special envoy on human rights a whore and a bitch after she criticized a bill restricting interfaith marriage and religious conversions in Myanmar. Um, this again may seem to you very violent to show, but I do think that the world should know what is happening to the Rohingyas. And as you see, it's the defense of a non-violent religion by violence instead of achieving peace by peaceful means.
I go, I just... Right, so um, this is um, Bangladesh border guards um, who, on both sides of the border, they're pushing back. Um, nobody wants the Rohingya. Um, so um, this is just symbolic, really, of what's happening to them. Um, I know you've been very patient. If I may, I'll just read the conclusion and then finish. Conclusion. I found it almost impossible to write a convincing conclusion to this talk. Phrases such as advancing multi-religious cooperation to help resolve conflict and advance development come to mind. But they seem so abstract, so lofty, so distanced from the often chaotic and very human realities of fieldwork. Our actual experience was often of rushing about in tuk-tuks or taxis, trying to locate unnumbered houses, setting up meetings, going from one NGO to another, eating noodles or dal bart in tiny roadside cafes, and occasionally meeting important religious leaders, development or aid workers, and politicians in the luxury hotels frequented by foreigners and NGOs. I hope that the PowerPoint gave an indication of the complexity of long-running conflicts. I suggested previously that religious peacebuilding as a theoretical discipline is focused on armed interstate violence. But there is now greater need for integrated, multi-perspectival, interdisciplinary responses to structural and cultural violence by educators, aid, development agencies, religious leaders, academics, NGOs, state and international governments. Moreover, violence is increasingly driven not by interstate armed conflict, but by local militias, armed criminal gangs, local resource-related conflict, narcotics and women trafficking, or local conflicts with transnational ideological connections. The power of the media to spread hate speech has enabled violence to be triggered and spread like wildfire. The case of Myanmar shows the fits and starts by which peace processes pro progress. The ecstasy with which many greeted the election of Aung San Suu Kyi's NLD shows how much the Burmese and the international community looked to her to seize control of the country, bring peace where there was conflict, and prosperity where there was poverty. This ecstasy has turned to dismay as ethnic conflicts escalate and a Rohingya Muslim insurgency that has prompted army retaliation on a horrific scale appalls the international community. I have distinguished the views of those who see religion as a primary cause of social division, conflict and war and those who argue that this is a distortion of the true significance of religion, which, when properly followed, promotes peace, harmony, goodwill, and social cohesion. The first view is that of the new atheists, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris, who argue that religion is the root cause of many of the world's intractable conflicts. The second is that of religions for peace and many faith-based organisations. I've also drawn attention to the assumed polarization of secularism and religion in religious peacebuilding and the dualisms and dilemmas inherent in religious peacebuilding theory, the dialectic between sacred and secular, individual versus structural justice, reconciliation versus retribution, just peace versus liberal peace, restorative justice versus human rights, holism versus integration. Such dualisms perhaps derive from the differences in worldview, discourse, and practices between secular enlightenment constructs and the world of religious life and com communities. However, in the actual world, secular concepts of human rights and religious principles and practices, interests and values are mutually inflected and at times integrated. Our experience in Myanmar and Nepal persuades me that NGOs, whether faith-based or secular, are most valuable 
where they see themselves in partnership with local populations and with each other. They are most vulnerable when perceived as carriers of Western or Christian values, political agendas, security and economic interests. Our projects were designed to explore if, whether and how religious-based organisations contribute to building more peaceful, stable communities and societies, and whether they have themselves been open to enrichment, even challenge, from local traditional justice resources. One of our aims in Nepal was to support partners in peace building in what training manuals would call a people-centered relationship building and participatory process by creating vertical and horizontal networks. In Myanmar, it was to understand the concerns and views of local people about the factors escalating conflict and the factors promoting peace. I came to conclude that a strategic, elicitive and relational peace-building approach focused on local priorities should nearly always be complemented by approaches based on human rights, democracy and a libertarian agenda if cycles of violence are ever to be ended. A theological approach can bind, blind us to issues of power in what Omar calls ethno-religious majoritarian states. Religious conflict resolution and peace building should never be separated from justice. Right. Um, I, owe, I would like to thank people now. I owe many thanks to Joy, our Vice Chancellor, and to Professor Liz Stewart, who have supported the Centre so generously and who are, in great part, responsible for the ambition and success of our centre. Liz puts up with us and pays for us, and sometimes slightly grumpily, but <laughs> um, she does it wonderfully well, and we are so very, very grateful to both Joy and Liz. I'm very grateful to my colleagues in TRS, Tina, Maya, Andreas, Tim, and Neil, to Professor Lisa Isherwood, Joe, and everyone in theological partnerships. To my collegiate colleagues in the centre, Mark, Simon, Mybrit, Rebecca, and Anat, and they really are absolutely wonderful and amazing colleagues. To our caring and cake-eating community in the Master's Lodge. To my brilliant and wonderful students and ex-students. To the Master, the Reverend Reg Sweet, and the Brothers of St. Cross. To the Reverend Professor Jolly and Mitchell, to my much loved friends, <sighs> and above all, <sighs> I can't say this, I'm so sorry. Above all, to Sophia, Barnaby, Esme, Juno, and Benedict. Thank you. I'm the grumpy one. <laughs> and it's my job this evening on behalf of us all to thank Anna. By tradition, there are no questions after an inaugural lecture, but Anna will be around afterwards if you want to ask her anything. So I'm just here to thank her on behalf of us all. Um, when I arrived here in uh, 1998, Anna was already... Um, an interna internationally recognised scholar in Hinduism and in uh, the discipline of religious studies and spirituality. And it's typical of Anna's humility that it was only last year that we could persuade her to apply for a professorship. She should have been one years ago. And you've, we've seen tonight that she's now engaged in some of the most important work this university does. In some of the most important work that any human beings can do. 
trying to build peace and reconciliation between peoples. We're so proud of you, Anna. We're so proud of the centre. Thank you for all you do, which is not at, um, without considerable personal risk on some occasions. So thank you for this evening and thank you for everything.